And the final announcement is, don't forget, there's three ways to support this ministry financially. Number one, you can use what we call the Yay God boxes. Little black boxes in the lobby that are on either side of the door as you come in or you come uh, as you go. It says Yay God box on the front of it. And we don't pass a plate. We don't pressure anybody to give. If you do decide to give financially, please just give whatever the Lord puts on your heart to give and we'll appreciate your generous support. You can also use the QR code or the URL that you see on the screen. It's also on the program that you were handed this morning, or you can send a check to the PO box. All three easy ways to make sure we're able to continue to do everything God's called us to do. Every single penny really does help. So mahalo for your support. Well, Shana Tova, which means Happy New Year, the Jewish New Year began earlier this week called Rosh Hashanah, which is also known as Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets. We talked about many times over the years on a future Yom Teruah, when the last trumpet sounds, Yeshua, Jesus, will return. This coming Friday is Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. That's followed by the 10 Days of Awe, and then we get to Sukkot, the Feast of of tabernacles. So this is an incredible holy season in Israel. Let's keep them in our prayers as they face a seven-front war with terrorism, an existential threat to the nation of Israel. Let's continue to pray for them. Well, this is week six of our seven-part series called Yahweh, and we've been looking at several Hebrew names, titles, and roles of God that appear in the Old Testament for God the Father. We're looking today at two Old Testament Hebrew names, Jehovah Tzidkanu and Jehovah Umkadesh. Now, technically, these names are Yahweh Tzidkanu and Yahweh Umkadesh. We've already talked about how Jehovah is really just a misspelling and a mispronunciation of Yahweh that was perpetrated by a 12th century Spanish monk and subsequent translations of the English Bible. So we still use the name Jehovah to tie together with all those established writings and names of God. But we need to be clear, it's really just a wrong spelling. It's really a wrong pronunciation of the Hebrew word Yahweh, the true personal name of God revealed to Moses. So Yahweh Tzidkanu uh, means the Lord our righteousness, or we can translate it from God's perspective, I am the Lord your righteousness, right? And it also refers to honesty, to righteous or right behavior, to justice, essentially doing the right thing. Now in Hawaiian, in Alelo Hawaii, uh, there's also a word, pono, which essentially means the same thing, right behavior. But there's an even more powerful word in Alelo Hawaii. It is the word kinaole. Kinaole means doing the right thing in the right way at the right time, in the right place, to the right person, for the right reason, with the right feeling, the first time. Isn't that an awesome word that means all of that? Kina ole, doing the right thing in the right way, at the right time, in the right place, to the right person, for the right reason, with the right feeling the first time. And it reminds me of a passage we read in last week's message as well. The Apostle Paul told us in Philippians 4.8, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, Whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Noble things, pure things, lovely things, admirable things, excellent things, praiseworthy thoughts and actions and words. So righteousness, right thinking, right behavior, right reasons, that's Sidkanu. And a lot of people get hung up on becoming a follower of Jesus Christ, because they've come to believe that the Bible is just a big book of don'ts. Don't do this, don't do that. I hear often that people think God's just out to rain on their parade, to spoil their party, to prevent them from having fun. But nothing could be further from the truth. When you spend time really reading and studying the Word of God, what you find is it's really a book of do's. Do this, do that, do the right thing, and you will experience abundant life. Read the Bible and you'll find there are a whole lot more do's than there are don'ts. And if you spend your time doing all the do's, you won't even have time to do the don'ts. And even if you could, you won't. So it's cool, right? So tzidkanu, hono, kina ole, just do the next right thing. 
And this name for God, Jehovah Tzidkanu, Yahweh Tzidkanu, it goes even beyond that idea, though. It's not that God just does righteous things or that God behaves in righteous ways or thinks righteous thoughts. That's what we can do with God's help. But God doesn't just do righteousness. God is righteousness itself. Without God, there can be no righteousness. Tzidkanu is the very concept of righteousness. It's not just acting with the right kind of behavior. It's literally being righteousness. Because without God, there would be no ultimate standard of right and wrong. Everybody would just decide for themselves what right and wrong behavior is. And as you can imagine, with almost 8 billion people on this earth, the opinions vary greatly about what is right and what is wrong. And even if there is such a thing as right or wrong. People argue about that. And so Jehovah Tzidkanu, Yahweh Tzidkanu means the Lord our righteousness. In other words, the only righteousness we can have must come to us as a gift from our Creator. Without Him, we're incapable of choosing righteous behavior. And the only reason we have the ability to choose right from wrong is because of an inherent grace given to us by God that pervasively infuses humanity throughout the planet. Without God's influence, whether we recognize it or not, we are incapable of avoiding evil and sin. We are incapable of choosing to do right. Now, the Apostle Paul, he talked about this as well. In the book of Romans, Paul perfectly describes this kind of internal spiritual battle that's going on with each of us. We, we know we should choose righteousness. We know we should choose right behavior, but we don't always do it. And even Paul struggled with this. He wrote about it. He said, For we know that the law of God is spiritual, but I am a flesh sold into bondage to sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For I am not practicing what I would like to do. I am doing the very thing I hate. But if I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. Paul says, So now... No longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good that I want, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want to do. But if I am doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. Then Paul says, I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, but I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. Because of that, he says, oh, wretched man that I am. Who will set me free from this body of death? And then he answers his own question. He says, ah, oh, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other with my flesh, the law of sin. That kind of struggle that's going on doesn't exist with God. Not in the Father, not in the Son, not in the Holy Spirit. All they are is righteousness. All they are is sinlessness. All they are is right behavior. All they are is right action, right thought. All three persons of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, are tzidkanu. They are righteousness itself. And the more we know about them, the more we love them. And the more time we spend with them, the more like them we will become. We can't become gods, as some religions and cults like Mormonism teach. We can't become a god, but we can become godly. We can become like God in this way, in having right thoughts, right behavior, right standing. But all of that, again, only comes through His grace, a gift given to us. So this name, Jehovah Tzidkanu, or Yahweh Tzidkanu, it first appears in Jeremiah 23. And it's part of a messianic prophecy. Who's going to be the Messiah? When's he going to come? And we now know it's ultimately fulfilled by Jesus. 
We could also call Jesus by the title Yeshua Sidkenu, to use his Hebrew name, right? So here's what the prophet Jeremiah had to say about this future Messiah, Yeshua. Jeremiah writes, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he will reign as king and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell securely. And this is his name by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness, or Yahweh Sidkenu. Now, Jeremiah, he gives a very similarly worded prophecy in chapter 33 as well. And these are the only two occurrences of this name, Jehovah Sidkenu or Yahweh Sidkenu. They're both messianic prophecies about Yeshua Sidkenu, Jesus, our righteousness that we celebrated this morning. With communion. Now, why is it important for us to know this? Well, we need to remember that the standard for making it into heaven on your own efforts, the standard for receiving eternal life on your own efforts, God's standard for that is 100% perfection. That's the standard. That's the only way we can dwell in the presence of God, is to be as righteous and as holy as as he is. Now, there's a huge problem, right? Because none of us are even close to that. We know all people sin. We all fall woefully short of the righteousness and the glory of God. We fall short of his right standards. That's why I'm so thankful that Yeshua Tzidkenu, Jesus our righteousness, came and lived a perfectly righteous human life. And then he willingly became all of my sin and all of your sin and sacrificed his life for us on the cross. And then he offered you and he offered me credit for his right behavior, for his righteousness, as if we had lived a perfectly holy and correct life like he did. He traded sin natures with us, Paul says. And through his resurrection, he defeated the powers of sin and hell and death and grave. His righteousness, his right standing is shared with me and shared with you simply because we have received him as the Savior and Lord in our lives. We've accepted the free gift of righteousness that he offered to us. And so now, because I follow him, because I follow Jesus, I am counted as righteous, even though I'm not. I'm like Paul. There's always this struggle to do what's right inside of me. The Apostle Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, he made him who knew no sin, that's Jesus, to be sin on our behalf. Why? So that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. So again, remember this name, Yahweh Tzidkenu. It means, I am the Lord, your righteousness. Or if we speak it from our point of view, the Lord, our righteousness. That truth has never been more evident than in the redeeming work of Jesus Christ on our behalf. He is the Lord, and he literally is our righteousness. If you're excited about that, would you say, yay, God? So the second name we're going to explore today is Jehovah Um Kadesh. And again, this is really Yahweh Um Kadesh, right? It means the Lord, our sanctification, or the Lord, our holiness, or from God's point of view, I am the Lord who sanctifies you, or I am the Lord who makes you holy. And the ideas of holiness and righteousness and sanctification, they're all closely related. Paul links them in 1 Corinthians 1. He says, but by his doing, by God's doing, you are in Christ Jesus. If you put your faith in Jesus, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that just as it is written, let him who boasts boast in the Lord. In other words, Jesus put a face on the wisdom, righteousness, holiness, sanctification, and redemption of God. And God gives us all these gifts through our relationship with Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Now, what does this mean when we say that God sanctifies us? What does that mean? That's a word we don't use much in modern English. What does this word sanctify mean? Well, it means to declare something or someone holy, to declare something or someone as belonging to God. This thing belongs to God now, 
I've sanctified it. I've given it to God. And the first use of this name, Jehovah Mkadesh, occurs in Exodus 31. When God says to Moses, say to the Israelites, you must observe my Sabbaths. This will be a sign between me and you for the generations to come so that you may know that I am Yahweh Mkadesh, the Lord who makes you holy. Now, when we are made holy, when we are sanctified, when we are consecrated, what does that mean? It means we've been called out from an old life of rebellion against God, where we act like we're the God of our own life. And instead now, we're set apart specifically to live for God, to be used by God. We belong to God, and we're joining God in His great plan for humanity. Now, sanctification or holiness really has two equally important parts. First is to be set apart from sin. Here's sin. Pull me out of that sin. And second, to be set apart to God. It's not just about getting loose of the sin. It's literally to be given to God, to be set apart for God, to God. And often, Christians, we get very focused on the first part of that, but we ignore the second part or we forget the second part. We do the best we can to avoid the things the Bible calls sins, at least what we think of as the really big sins. That's a good thing to do, but it's not the whole equation. We also need to have our lives completely set apart for God, to God. We need to actively and intentionally be doing and saying what God says we should be doing and saying. Don't do sins. Yeah, that's a good plan, but also do the righteous things, right? Don't just live a neutral life. Be set apart for God's use so that you will do and say the things God tells you to do and say. Now, the Apostle Peter talks about how both parts of sanctification play out for us in 1 Peter 2. He says to all followers of Jesus who are reading his words, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellence of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy." Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles so that in things which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. That By doing the right things, by being set apart for God's use, by belonging to God and doing what God tells you to do and saying what God tells you to say, even the people who are non-believers who are really feeling antagonistic against Christians, against Jesus, will see your good deeds, see your right behavior, and they will end up coming to faith as well. They'll become followers of Jesus, and they'll glorify God. Peter says we're called to be set apart from the mindset and the behaviors of the world that does not know God. We should look different. We should act different. We should think different. We should behave differently with a distinct flavor so that by our different example, people may become aware of God and choose to follow and glorify Him as well. Now, of course, Peter learned this idea from Jesus himself, who told us in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Then he said, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket. Instead, they put it on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works. For what purpose? To glorify your Father who is in heaven. So when Jesus talks about us being salty and being shining lights, he's talking about us being sanctified. He's talking about us being set apart for the glory and purposes 
of God. And again, Christianity is not just about us not doing the don'ts. It's so much more important for us to do the do's in life. Christianity is about becoming like Jesus, walking with Jesus, living for Jesus, having a relationship, having an intimate friendship with Jesus, doing what Jesus does, saying what Jesus says. The Apostle Paul says that he was called and set apart for God's use even while he was still in his mother's womb. He tried to live up to this goal of living for God in his own strength, in his own holiness, until he finally met Jesus on the road to Damascus one day. And then Paul came to realize that the only way to truly live a sanctified life is through the holiness of Jesus Christ living through you. It's the same for you and me. Psalm 139 says that God knit all of us together in our mother's wombs, that in the secret places He formed our bodies, and He created us with specific purposes, a specific calling in mind for each of us. More than that, Paul tells us God's calling on each of us began even before that, long, long, long ago. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Now listen, don't miss this. Listen, just as He chose us in Him, when? Before the foundation of the world. Before He created the universe. He'd already thought of you. He'd already chosen you in His heart and mind. That we would be holy and blameless before Him. So as Christians, God chose us to be holy, to be blameless, to be righteous, to be sanctified, to be set apart for His purposes and His glory. And He did all that even before He created the heavens and the earth. So holiness, sanctification, it isn't something we can do on our own. Holiness, sanctification, righteousness is only something we can receive from God. It's credited to us. It's given to us by God, by Yahweh Kadesh, when we connect with and follow His Son, Jesus. And no matter how hard we try, no matter how many sins we overcome, we won't ever be perfectly holy on our own. We won't ever be perfectly righteous. We won't ever be perfectly sanctified. But listen, God knows that. And because He is holy and we are not, we can't interact with Him. He is Holy, holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, holy. He is holy, holy, separated from us by His holiness. But that's an unacceptable situation for Him. So He made a solution. He sent Jesus to be a human being who was holy. And as the representative for the entire human race, Jesus brings us along with Him to that relationship with our holy God. And we are made holy not because of any work or value of our own, but simply as a gift from the God who loves us, from the God who wants to be in relationship with us. This realization that God is Yahweh M. Kadesh, the Lord who sanctifies us, should, however, spur us on to do our best to continue to live sanctified lives, set apart lives, holy lives for Him. We know we won't ever fully arrive at the goal of perfection on our own, but we should be constantly pressing on, living our life as Christ-like as possible, and then trusting Jesus to fill in all the blanks wherever we fall short. He will count as perfect because of our relationship. He will count us as perfect because of our relationship with Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Now, there's a singer and a songwriter named David Crowder. He wrote a great song that talks about this very idea that we are set apart, that we are sanctified, that we are counted as holy by our holy God, even though we don't yet live fully sanctified, fully holy lives. That should be our great goal and great desire, though, to be holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, holy, H-O-L-Y. David's song goes like this. He says, I am full of earth. You are heaven's worth. I am stained with dirt, prone to depravity. You are everything that is bright and clean. The antonym of me, you are divinity. 
But a certain sign of grace is this. From the broken earth, flowers come up, pushing through the dirt. And you are holy, holy, holy. Oh, heaven cries, holy, holy God. You are holy, holy, holy. I want to be holy like you are. You are everything that is bright and clean. And you're covering me with your majesty. And the truest sign of grace is this. From wounded hands re. Redemption fell down, liberating man, and you are holy, holy, holy. Oh, heaven cries, holy, holy God. You are holy, holy, holy. I want to be holy like you are. But the harder I try, the more clearly can I feel the depth of our fall and the weight of it all. And so this might could be the most impossible thing, your grandness in me, making me clean glory, hallelujah, glory, glory. Hallelujah. So here I am, all of me, finally, everything holy, holy, holy. I am holy, holy, holy. I am holy, holy, holy yours. I am holy yours. And I am full of earth and dirt and you. Now, before Genesis 1-1 even happened, what we just read, God had already created you. God had already sanctified you in his mind and heart. He is perpetually and constantly calling you to live apart from the sinful ways of this broken world. He wants you to wholly belong to him. God loves you. God has a plan for your life. So he's constantly calling out to you to call you out of one life into a different, more abundant, more fulfilling, better life with him. Now, as I said in the beginning of this message, God doesn't just practice righteousness. He actually is righteousness itself. He's Jehovah Sidkenu, Yahweh Sidkenu. That's true about this name as well. Jehovah M. Kadesh, Yahweh M. Kadesh. God is sanctification. He himself is set apart from everything and everyone else. He is wholly other than his creation. He is outside of time. He is outside of space. He's completely different from anything and everything else in the universe he created. Deuteronomy 4.35 tells us, To you it was shown that you might know that the Lord, He is God. There is no other besides Him. And 1 Samuel 2.2 says, There is no one holy like the Lord. Indeed, there is no one besides you, nor is there any rock like our God. Now that term that God is a rock, it's a very common biblical metaphor for God. It appears several times in the book of Samuel Many times in the book of Psalms, God is called my rock. He's called the rock of my salvation, the rock of strength. Uh, And as you know, we live in a very pluralistic world. Values and morals and ideals, they're constantly changing and shifting. Laws change all the time. New loopholes are constantly invented to get around the laws that do exist. People make all kinds of false claims that are competing and contradictory ideas that They say they can both be true at the same time. That's not possible. And we are encouraged not to live by the truth, but instead we're always encouraged, just live your own truth. Just live your own truth, whatever that may be. It's easy for many people to feel like they're standing on unstable ground in life, that they're standing on shifting, sinking sand. And Scripture repeatedly makes it clear to us 
Our God is the solid rock. His values are solid. His law is secure. What God says is good will always be good. What he says is evil will always be evil. What God says is true is actually the only truth. God is the definer of history. God is the author of holiness. God is the definition of righteousness and sanctification. We can feel secure. We can feel safe. We can feel content in knowing that he's not going to pull the rug out from under us one day and change all the rules on us. We can have assurance and trust in him. We can build our lives upon him and upon all that he tells us is true and right and just. He is the solid ground. He is rock solid. One of the key elements of parenting, I was always told, is consistency. The kids want to know where the line is. They want us to say, don't cross this line. On this side of the line is good behavior. On that side of the line is bad behavior. On this side of the line is safety. On that side of the line is danger. Kids need to know at what point have I actually crossed the line and broken the rule. And a good parent keeps those lines consistent and communicates them clearly to their children. An ineffective parent is one who's constantly moving the line. So today, you can cross that line 10 times and have no repercussions at all. But tomorrow, because I'm in a bad mood, if you cross that line one time, you're in big trouble. Today, the line you cannot cross is here, but tomorrow it might be over there or over there. And day to day, children with those kind of parents live frustrated, confused, anxious lives because the line is always changing. The standard of what is right and what is wrong is always changing. They never know where they stand. It's kind of like that in our world right now. There are people constantly trying to move the lines of what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is evil, and you never really know where you stand. God is not like that. Our God is a perfect parent, and our God is the rules. Our God is the the line. Our God is the standard of what is right, what is wrong, what is good, what is evil. Jesus told us, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house, and yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Aren't you glad that our God is not a shifting, changing, moving target that's hard to hit? No matter how this world changes and rages, God stays the same. Amen? Hebrews 13.8 tells us Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. He is the solid rock. His word is the solid rock. His standards, his laws, his rules, his expectations are all consistent and solid. He calls us to be like him. He calls us to be set apart. He calls us to be different from the rebellious world. He calls us to clearly live for him, to live holy, sanctified lives. And when he does that, he knows we'll try and we'll fail at times while we'll succeed at other times. So he already tells us, listen, I'm just going to fill in the blanks of wherever you come up short. Everywhere you fall short, I'll fill in the blanks as long as you follow and trust me. I praise Jesus that he uh, doesn't just command sanctification from us. He doesn't ex just expect sanctification from us. He is our sanctification. And so if we have God in us, then we are holy in his sight. God is Jehovah M. Kadesh, Yahweh M. Kadesh. He is the Lord, our sanctification. And if we stay in him, if we build our lives on him, then we will be sanctified by him. We will be considered holy by him. Remember Peter's words from earlier. We are a chosen race. We are a royal priesthood. We are a holy nation. We are a people for God's own possession. 
Why? So that we may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. For once we were not a people, but now we are the people of God. We had not received mercy, but now we have received mercy. We are set apart. We are sanctified. We belong to him, our rock and our redeemer, Yahweh Um Kadesh, the Lord who sanctifies us. And he can do that because he is also Yahweh Tzidkanu, the Lord, our righteousness. Amen? Yay, God. Let's pray together as Joel and Benny come to lead us in a closing time of worship. Father God, I thank you for revealing these two powerful parts of your character to us through the holy scriptures of the Old Testament. Yahweh Sidkanu, Yahweh Mkadesh, the Lord, our righteousness, the Lord, our holiness. Father, thank you for calling us even before you created this universe, you put out the call to us that you wanted to have a personal relationship with us, that you had a plan and a purpose for our life. I pray that everybody here hearing this message today, everyone watching online right now live, everyone who will see this later down through the years to come online would really believe that today, this truth that God loves you. God loves you and he has a plan and a purpose for your life. God calls you. He pulls you out of the world that is against him and makes you a part of a holy nation that lives for him, in him, through him. God, I pray for everyone today, if they've never made that relationship connection before, that today would be the day that they say, Jesus, I put my faith, my trust in you. I ask you to be the Lord and Savior of my life. Be the God that you are for me. I don't want to be God anymore. You are God, and I'm ready to follow you as my Lord. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross as my sin and giving me your righteousness. What an amazing gift. Thank you for that, Jesus. I ask you to take your rightful place as the Savior of my life. I embrace the promise that you give me of abundant life in this world and eternal life in the next put my heart and soul into all that you call me to do. I want to live for you. If that's the prayer of your heart today, you can just say, me too, God, me too. That's what I want to do. I want to be righteous for you. God bless each one here today in the way they most need to hear from you. Make yourself real to them. Make yourself known to them. And by the end of this day, may they feel like they know you a little bit better and love you a little bit more. That's my prayer for all of us today in Jesus' name. Amen.